So uh, just to give you a little bit of a perspective, this was 1938. And even at that time, our part of Boulder, um, which we're only a mile north of downtown Boulder, um, we're in the lower right-hand corner, as they're pointing out. Um, but you can also see that there were still were a lot of farms in our part of Boulder. If you see all those little dots, those nice, even little dots, those are all orchards. So a lot of area in this was orchard area. But now if we go to the next slide, we'll see today those orchards are gone, except for growing gardens, our wonderful tenant on the east part of our property, so that's on the right-hand side, they've actually established orchards. So it's wonderful to have that return. But we are literally a farm in the city. And we do grow irises. They've always been a part. We've been growing on our farm over 100 years, and they've always been a part. But for the last 50 years, it's pretty much been exclusive. We do a mail order and a U-dig. Um, but when we're growing one crop like this, you can imagine um, that's pretty hard on the soil. So we used to do things pretty conventionally, um, large fields, row cropping, a lot of cultivation, leaving fields fallow. Um, the, you know, so we've, we've tried to change our practices. And so we do try to keep the soil covered and keep a living root. And unfortunately, a lot of times that means it's weeds. But my theory is that if the iris is a dominant plant um, and it's not creating too much problem, it's still good to have a living root, even if that's weeds. We strive some day to, to have it look like some of Dale's wonderful slides. Over the years, we've gotten to where we do things smaller. This is one of our main U-dig fields. Um, we try to use part of it um, on the right there. You're seeing people uh, doing hand weeding and we're, that's where the iris are. But on the left, we've got a cover crop. And so normally we're switching back and forth. So those plants, hopefully a lot of them would be dug and sold and the rest harvested. And then we'd be switching back over to the cover crop side and then planting cover crop where the iris are, so back and forth. And we used to do a lot of single species cover cropping like this buckwheat, and then the next slide. Also using rape or canola. You can see that again, our Udic, main Udic field is, but we had it planted in rape. And that's because um, we have a lot of problems because we're growing the same thing year after year, even with good fertility. With iris, you never get this as good a result as if you plant into virgin soil that didn't have iris. And some growers have solved that problem, or they think they've solved that problem, by using chemical soil sterilants. And we certainly didn't want to go that route. So we got really interested in biofumigation and using brassicas, and in this case, the rape, for a biofumigant to see if we could eliminate whatever it is, uh, what pathogens or allelopathic effect or whatever, to create better um, conditions. And it's really, we know it works. Um, we don't always know why it works, but anyway. And that's an area I really like to know more about is biofumigants. I got away from the single species cover crops because we introduced goats on the property. And so generally we use a lot of multi-species with cereal grains mixed with legumes. Um, that's next slide. For the legumes, it's usually hairy vetch or field peas, um, Austrian peas. And then, like I say, a mix of cereal grains kind of depends, but rye is usually the dominant one. Say we, we um, have another nonprofit that came on, Mount Flower Goat Dairy, which is now being managed and part of growing gardens. Um, and so we use the goats and it is a raw milk dairy and, you know, people don't seem to want their milk to taste like mustard. And so I've had to adjust my cover cropping practices. I also think that um, we don't thrive usually very well on a single species eating one thing and the goats, it's better off when they're uh, grazing on multi-species. We use the portable electric fence so we can graze them on um, fairly small concentrated areas. And if we're gonna be just going through once, we graze it down pretty much pretty low. Sometimes we'll do two grazings on a cover crop, depending on timing. And sometimes, you know, we let things go a little longer than we would like to. Can't always get to things, but the goats being browsers love it when we let uh, the cereal grains get a little taller like this, and it's kind of fun to watch them. And sometimes we do let things go long enough if we're not going to be um, planting into this area to actually let things go to seed and reseed. Um, we've had pretty good luck with reseeding with both 
some of the cereal grains, especially the rye, of course, and also the hairy veg and the peas. And just, um, I know we've talked a little bit about fertility, but this was an area where we had sheep composted on the right-hand side and with um, manure and the bedding from the goats. And then we had just pulled the iris out on the left-hand side and hadn't done anything. But we thought, oh, well, we don't want to leave it there. And so we seeded it at the same time with the same mix of cover crop. And that's just to show you it really does, fertility does matter. Um, so uh, a lot of difference, plus you see a lot of weeds coming up on uh, cheatgrass in that area we hadn't worked on. And then we're trying some different ways this year. We, um, one of our U-dig fields, we decided to go even to smaller sections. So we've got two rows of iris planted and then two rows of cover crop, which we use a lot of oats in this case in our fall planting. And of course the oats winter kill, before they killed, we actually um, went through and, and cut and um, fed to the goats. Um, but then leaving that stubble of oats has been really good so far this winter when it's been a very dry, windy winter and, and create a little bit of, um, of, of windbreak, but also keeping more of the soil covered. And so we hope that all those practices that in the spring, it's gonna look like this but we're still learning just like everybody else and still trying to figure out particularly how you row crop, how you, how you grow a plant like this and keep the soil covered. Thanks. We, uh, we put in a new sprinkler one year over by Highway 287 and we planted a light crop into it the last week of June. We planted a sorghum crop into it three years ago so this would have been 2018. We planted a sorghum crop in and we were gonna take it off for silage in uh, September. And we got to uh, about the uh, middle of July and we decided to, I decided to try and fly a cover crop on. So we finally got one flew on about the last, the third week of August, the fourth week of August. Then we uh, had to turn the sprinkler on and we ran the sprinkler continuously for about 10 days, putting down about two tenths of an inch every time it passed over, trying to keep the top of the ground wet so we could get the cover crop to sprout. Uh, we planted a, a grazing wheat that also had triticale in it. It had a fall triticale and it had some peas in it. We had a pretty good uh, sprouting. The wheat and the triticale sprouted pretty good. The peas, they didn't sprout quite as well, but when you went out and looked at them, you could see quite a few peas that had swelled, but they didn't uh, take hold because we didn't have any ground cover over the peas. So I think the learning lessons here was if you're gonna plant peas, you're gonna have to come up with some kind of a ground cover in it. If you look at this picture here, they had uh, windrowed it for chopping. And then that was the year that uh, right after we windrowed it, we got that foot and a half of snow on it. So then these windrows had to lay for quite a while. And uh, they came back in and they moved them merged them together so that they could finally chop them when it started to dry out. And one of the factors that we seen was that every place we had a windrow, we lost our cover crop because it laid too long. It had to lay about two and a half weeks before it would dry out enough to become silage. That was one of the, the factors that we uh, found that was a little tough on this is, you know, depending on what your fall crop is, uh, it works. Uh, flying it on was a little difficult because we, in Northern Colorado, we finally found uh, an outfit that would fly it on and they had to mount a spreader on their plane so they could spread the cover crop seed. And uh, they didn't get it mounted until about the last week of August. And if I had to do this over again, I would try to fly it in mid-July or even a little bit earlier. And uh, this was our first year at experimenting with it. This field then went to corn the following spring. We just uh, strip tilled it and planted it to corn. We took the corn off for silage. And then this year uh, we went back in, we were gonna plant it to winter wheat and then we decided to go to an annual ryegrass crop. And we used an annual ryegrass crop on it this year. We planted it in uh, the end of March and uh, we grew it up and the tentative plan was to uh, take a couple cuttings of hay off of it for our livestock. And our livestock is primarily horses. And then we were gonna terminate it and fall plant alfalfa. But with the way the year went and the drought and stuff, we uh, 
needed a little more pasture for our horse operation. So we actually let it grow after we cut the second cutting of hay the second week of August. And uh, we have two of these fields. One is 60 acres and one is 40 acres. They're both under center pivots. And our fall grazing on this annual ryegrass was pretty amazing. We, we anticipated that we finally came back with a ton or a ton and a half of, of fall grazing off of this. We've actually put 80 head of horses on there for two months this fall. Now it's just a, a dead stubble, and uh, but it looks pretty good. And I'm kind of excited to see what happens next year when we've got those roots left in the ground to see what kind of uh, a filtration factor and stuff is. When we uh, finished this field this fall and we finished irrigating on the 6th of October with this center pivot and we use a crop consultant and we had to probe the moisture depth and we actually had moisture stored in that ground down to the 32, 33 inch level. So uh, I'm gonna be kind of curious to see what happens to it this spring where it's been covered and stuff and we've had a dry, a dry winter. The moisture in that ground to me is gonna be fairly interesting to see what it's done over the winter. You know, one thing I might bring up that a lot of people need to be aware of is on these fall crops, when you're going into this livestock grazing situation, uh, some of these fall cover crops that you will plant, sorghums and stuff, if you're not careful, they can collect nitrates on you and your animals. You have to really uh, do some lab testing and stuff on your soils. And you also have to know your animals. You know, and the rough thing that I will tell you is like cattle, goats, lambs, uh, ruminant animals, anything over a half a percent in nitrogen, and you're going to start running into some animal issues. Now, in my situation, one of these fields was a little bit high in nitrogen, but I use utilize horses, and horses can handle a nitrate level up to about four or five percent because they're a hindgut digester. So when you start looking at your cover crops and stuff, you need to also put in mind if you're going to graze them and use livestock on them that uh, if you get an early freeze in the fall or something that's going to terminate them early and you know they they die down and they're carrying a lot of nitrate and stuff there's some some factors that you need to put into play when you're picking your cover crops based on your livestock i was asked i was pleased to give a short presentation on my experience with cover crop over the last couple of decades and apparently i didn't take enough pictures of my cover crops to, to give you a really good view of what I, we've done. Uh, I'm the fourth generation to take care of our family farm east of Longmont. This is my mom and dad in this picture and my son, Scott, who's been on the farm for uh, the last five years or so. And I've been doing this close to 50 years myself. When, when I Googled cover crops, this is what I get. And I think Dale and I are probably gonna have to have a conversation about this after some time in the future. but. I've got a little different perspective on, on cover crops. I haven't seen anything like this in, in, in our part of the country. And again, this is planting in that same picture and it's very difficult for us to do this. And again, I think it goes back to moisture. Uh, if we had this in our corn planting area, uh, our fields would probably be very dry and very hard and not sure what we could get planted there. And again, it's it's how much irrigation and, and how can we justify our water resources caring for, caring for a cover crop where we farm. Uh, there's a lot of intent for a cover crop and what you want that cover crop to accomplish. And in the next few slides I've done, this is some of the cover crops we've done in our farms. And these cover crops were planted for to take care of wind erosion. And again, this is uh, about 40 pounds of, of rye seed planted in, prior to a sugar beet crop. Same picture, and, and it is, it's mostly structured for wind uh, protection. Again, you can see that this, this crop was sprayed uh, with a herbicide to eliminate it uh, before it gets too big. Uh, the sugar beets in this picture are getting close to being able to protect themselves. Uh, in the sugar beet world, we've got uh, some research to show that uh, the sugar beets, uh, it will impede the, the sugar beet crop if you let the, the green cover crop get too too big. Again, I mean, we're, we're in a very arid, dry state, and we have trouble getting our, trouble getting our cover crops established. Uh, the next few slides show a cover crop that was planted in the latter part of 2020. Uh, this field was planted on October 1st last year. 
following a corn silage crop. The field was sprinkled immediately following with about three inches of water and, it, and it's fairly, fairly successful what we have. And this picture was taken just a week ago. So that's the size of our cover crop today. Somebody said something about geese earlier in the presentation in their 10 words. This is the same exact field. And it's what I said about a box of chocolates, you never know what you're gonna run into. And this field was, uh, the, the, rubber, the right crop was demolished in areas by the geese. And we've lost a lot of the cover crop and under this pivot. We're hoping that there's enough left that will actually come back and hopefully the geese decide to, to go somewhere else here shortly. This is our one parcel in um, Boulder County open space farm that we've been running the multi-year experiment with compost and cover crops. And, and this field was planted in, into a clover cover crop in September, again, following a small grain harvest. Uh, we irrigated this field also with sprinkler with about three inches of water. Uh, the residue that's out here, that the cover crop in this field was planted for nitrogen source for the 2021 crop, which will be corn. We have a lot of volunteer out here that's really been a challenge for the clover to get established. And so, We've got a little small picture here is a close up of what the clover actually looks like right now. Again, we've got volunteer triticale from the 2020 crop that's going to green up again in about a month. And I think it's going to probably overtake the, uh, the clover crop. Uh, this rye crop was also planted in the first part of October, and we did not have the ability to water this crop. And this again was planted for erosion purposes. There's going to be alfalfa planted here in a couple of months. And this, this is what the field looks like when you back up a little bit and look at it. Not much there and with the seed bed that's out there for alfalfa planting, it's gonna need something to keep it from, from blowing. But we've, we went back to and talked about the one field of, on Boulder County that we did have been doing experiments on. And the prior years we've done um, multiple cover crops and vetch was planted in this field prior to this crop. And it's, this is all strips that we've been on. And there's a few numbers on here, but the bottom line is that we're doing better with just compost and no cover crops. When you look at all the data at the end of the, on the very right hand side of, of that, that chart. A couple of quick slides here. This is his combining uh, barley last, last, uh, last fall. I always like to throw a couple of machine pictures in there. We don't have any tractors, but there's combined. And, and again, we talked about spreading compost. We've spread compost on almost all of our barley acres that we harvested last year. A uh, quick close up of what that looks like. I think we're, we're getting probably more good out of our composting than we are with cover crops. But again, we, we've done cover crops in the past and we're going to continue to do it again. Uh, another thing we do is we do a lot of strip tilling where you plant uh, your crop in between the, the residue and, we, and we've done fairly well with that. We've done a lot of, uh, this is a picture of our planting in, in between the, the residue and the uh, strip tilled operation. Uh, do a little uh, no-till, a couple of pictures of our no-till crop coming up. This is a couple of years ago and just a quick picture of what our corn looked like, looked like last August. Uh, my final slide is something that I think everybody needs to be aware of that uh, farming in Northern Colorado, this, would make, this makes it possible. If it wasn't for irrigation, we'd probably grow very little and the opportunities to do any conservation tillage or cover cropping would be very difficult at best. I am in Northern Colorado. And also just outside of Livermore. Uh, anyway, so we, we run 500 mother cows and then we farm about 800 irrigated acres, um, mostly um, grass hay, mostly predominantly grow and, uh, perennial hay crops, um, of which some are straight grass, some are alfalfa grass mix, and some is straight alfalfa. And I, I think one misnomer that we probably overlook all the time is um, perennial crops, perennial grass crops are the best cover crop there is because they don't have to be replanted every year. And I, and I think that uh, too often we don't include that into cover crop 
definitions, um, but we, we do really well. We get good soil health out of perennial grass and alfalfa cover uh, hay crops. Um, granted, they're not um, commodity crops, they're not cash crops, but uh, they sure help me feed some cows and that becomes a better cash crop than, than just growing corn or something on those fields. And at 6,000 feet, we have uh, borderline problems with, uh, with freezing and short season growing. So we've tried some, some Sudex or Sorghum Sudan grass and, and, uh, and we run into problems this year, particularly it froze out the first week of September and it didn't, it didn't grow any longer than that. So this is a, crop, a field that we just broke open and it was uh, rototilled for hemp. And then uh, I let some hemp growers come in and grow. And what I found is that hemp growers think that their plants are gonna get really big. So they leave a lot of bare ground, which was um, huge problems for erosion and uh, compaction. And so we went in and interseeded cover crops into their hemp crop. And then, and then since then, we've done a lot of cover cropping on our hay fields as we plant alfalfa or different things um, with annuals and perennials, and that seems to help. Um, lessons learned that we've had with, with cover crops is sometimes the mixes sound really good, but they over germinate because the conditions are too good. And so the, the cover crops overtake some crops. And uh, in this, this particular situation, this is radishes and turnips and they grew taller than the hemp plants. And maybe that's just the fault that the hemp growers didn't know what they were doing, but they germinated better than we expected and they overtook. And so, so sometimes when the conditions are too good, you gotta cut back your seeding rates. Um, and what we've had found is turnips and radishes um, germ germinate really well. And so we've cut back our rates a lot because we'd rather have bigger turnips than little turnips um, because it just helps with, with breaking up the compaction a little more. Um, this is, uh, this is just after germination and on an interseeding crop. And, and so you can see that, that it comes up fast after, after the fact, because these hemp growers like to put a lot of nutrients out. And again, their plants are six feet apart. So they waste a lot of nutrients and those cover crops are out there grabbing them. Um, and so then when, once they get a hold of those nutrients down to um, a good water supply, a nutrient supply, they, they take off and, and you got to watch that overtaking your cash crop if you're going to try to interseed like this but so but we do end up with good grazing afterwards and so we have turnips that get to be the size of uh, you know softballs and uh, which is a good size that means the cows can't eat them all and when we turn them out in the fall and the winter and it means that the antelope and the deer um, have to work pretty hard to eat very much and uh, that's the biggest problem we have really with cover crops um, as far as grazing goes is m getting um, getting the timing right so that the antelope and the deer don't come and eat all of our cover crop before we can get cattle onto it to get some value out of it. Um, from a soil health perspective, it, it doesn't matter. Um, the antelope and the deer do a really good job of nu nutrient cycling and getting that cover crop turned back into nutrients in the soil, but that doesn't help me with grazing. We've been working on trying to improve that timing a little bit um, without trying to be real rude about chasing wildlife off, but they just like uh, your geese problem, um, when they see something green and everything else is brown, they tend to show up and, and take it. So that, that causes us a lot of trouble. The other thing that we've, we've gotten into, so, so with all of our fall cover crops, we do like to throw a little triticale in there. And with triticale, um, sometimes we don't get any use out of it in the, winter, in the winter time, but it comes back up really good in the spring and we terminate it by grazing it. Um, so we'll turn in, um, we try to turn in on like a hundred acre field, we'll turn in 200 critters. Sometimes we have a hard time finding 200 critters, so we have to combine horses and cattle, and uh, they all do pretty well on it. Um, incidentally, we found out that through that process, uh, those animals don't like to eat hemp. Um, we were hoping that they would terminate the volunteer hemp problem, and they go near the volunteer hemp problem. So um, incidentally, we learned a good way to manage weeds and hemp is to just graze it. Um, we also planted um, teff grass as a cover crop um, and with the intent to graze and harvest. And we, we tried something different just because of the teff grass seed is so small. We were having a hard time with our equipment to get it out there. And I thought it would be cheaper to mix it with the fertilizer and then put it through the co-op's um, air spreader. And so they spread it with their air spreader. And um, we had a real weird germination problem. It, it germinated in, in uh, variable rates at different parts of the spreader's pattern. 
and we still aren't real sure why. Um, some of it is probably incorporation. We probably should have incorporated it, but uh, it also had something to do with the fertilizer because the nitrates were way different throughout that pattern. Um, but the test grass is an interesting annual cover crop. Um, it's good animal feed. It's 20% protein. It grows really fast. It's really, really soft, palatable feed for, for all of the livestock that we put out there. We've grazed it. We bailed hay out of it, and the cat, it works really good for, for our little calves. And, and then we um, used it for, for different things. Um, it does, it is a little hardier for the winter frost kill. It lasts a little longer than the Sudex did, uh, but then um, it also didn't produce as much as the Sudex did. So, and then the other thing we've tried, and we'll see if it, by using just a natural cover crop, is just leaving the perennial short grass prairie or planting back in some blue gamma and letting it kind of protect the soil in the winter time and then having the alfalfa and the and the like wheat grass grow up taller than it in the summertime so we just key line plow it and then we um and it it's um it's a trial we're not sure where we're going to go with this yet but it uh, the alfalfa and, the, and it will come up and uh and hopefully we will always have a nice short grass prairie sod that covers the ground pretty hard and then we'll allow the, the hay crop to grow above that. Um, but this is, this is just on a pasture that gets very, very highly variable water supply. So if, if we don't get a crop out of it, that happens. Um, and sometimes we have enough water, we can irrigate it and get um, the alfalfa to actually produce enough to cut. Otherwise it just kind of comes up a little bit and then goes dormant. And that, that kind of helps us manage some of these areas where when there's extra water available, we can get a crop out of it. And if there's not, then uh, we can just graze it. And even when we, we do irrigate it, we typically always graze the aftermath because it gives us an, a secondary opportunity to, to cycle the nutrients in and out and, uh, and then also kind of manage the weeds. Um, the livestock do a pretty phenomenal job of managing a lot of the weeds. Um, outside of hemp. That's our cover crops. I mean, it's just been kind of hit and miss. We try things. Some, some things don't work. Um, the, the main takeaway that I have from, from cover crops is if you don't have enough water and you don't have enough nutrients, um, don't, don't think they're going to solve all your problems because uh, you, you have to treat them as a crop. If you do, they do really well. But if you just think you're going to incidentally solve all your problems by throwing seed on the ground, you're probably wasting some of your money and you might do better asking uh, somebody like Dale or, or the guys at Green Cover or or your agronomist, like uh, to get to get some advice on that because you'll you'll be much more successful if you kind of have a good plan with it and kind of create a, a long term budget with water and nutrients. Um, it it will not solve all your problems on its own. Dan, have you ever tried growing teff? Uh, no, I've never tried growing teff. I, well, I take that back. I tried it when it first came out about 10 years ago, and it was on flood irrigated ground, and I didn't get a very good germination. And so I've never really tried it again. Uh, you know, we've used the annual ryegrass for the last couple of years. And uh, my feed analysis, I have probably 50 or 60 different feed analysis stored in my computer on on my crops over the last two years and my annual ryegrass is producing somewhere between three four five ton to the acre when I include my grazing and it's packing about 14 and a half to 15 percent protein so it's really doing exactly the job I need and um, it's a little easier to manage than the uh, TEF. I can plant the ryegrass in the fall if I need to if I'm coming off of a corn crop or I can plant it in the spring uh, same time they'd be planting barley or something like that. And uh, and it's done pretty good. I mean, I've watched it. Some of the dairies down in Texas use this annual ryegrass and they put it on a 30 day rotation out of their sprinklers and they cut it every 30 days and they use it actually as a protein supplement crop because they'll get up around 20, 25% uh, protein with it if you'll cut it in the boot state. So I've tried the teff grass, but it was quite a few years ago. Paul, it sounds maybe like you're not so sure about the benefits of cover crop from your experience. And what would make it more successful in your opinion? I think cover crops are vital to continue to, to, to be successful in, in what we're doing. I mean, we're doing so many 
the, the, the experimental field that we, we had the picture of uh, on Boulder County Open Space, we have probably a dozen different experiments that we're going to do there this year, whether it's strip till, no till, compost, fertilizer placement, and, and cover crop. I mean, we're, we kind of failed, I believe, there this year. But I think the nitrogen building uh, cover crops are, are vital to, to be able to continue profitably in, in this world. And one of the notes, uh, a note that I made was that we have to be successful. That's all we do. We don't have anything to back us up. So whatever we do, there's got to be success. We also lease several farms. And you have to convince the landowner that what you're doing is the right thing that's going to be profitable in, in, in years to come. And if you fail, it really can set these this cropping system back really severely. Uh, so, no, I, I think cover crops are, are absolutely vital to what we do. And again, it, there's different intent for different cover crops. And one of the, the one of the most beneficial ones is for wind erosion. And again, the pictures I showed you were from this year, which was a very, very dry winter. So I think this was probably one of the most unsuccessful years for developing a cover crop. So we're going to keep doing it. Zach, if he had to add more nutrients to make his cover crop work, what kind and how much? And his response was, is he does have the best success with using a limited amount, uh, typically 50, 30, 0. And Dan had mentioned about the nitrate um, and pasturing Sudan grasses. So what would maybe be some other recommendations for summer cover crops? Um, to pasture cattle with? Yeah, virtually any tall growing crop can um, can accumulate nitrate. It's not limited to sedan grass. Sedan is the one everyone thinks about, but corn can have it, pigweeds can have it, lambs quarters kosher, uh, any plant that gets tall. And, and the tall is because nitrate moves into the plant and then uh, when it hits a leaf that's sunlit, it will convert into protein. Plant will combine that energy from photosynthesis, change that nitrate into protein. So the farther up the stem it travels, the longer it remains as nitrate within the plant. So uh, low growing plants tend not to have nitrate issues uh, because the, the animal consumes leaves. If you almost probably 85 to 90% of the nitrate in a plant will be in the lower foot of the stock. So if you are grazing, nitrate is fairly rare in a grazing situation. Now, the drier conditions, anything that stops photosynthesis in the plant, drought, cloudy weather, frost, you know, cold, um, lack of sulfur is a big issue. I like to provide as much of the nitrogen needs of the plant as I can with uh, some sort of organic source, whether that's a legume cover crop or manure, um, something where all the nitrogen isn't converted into the nitrate form very rapidly, like uh, is with what happens with synthetic fertilizers. Um, the Also the benefit of those um, carbon-based, um, you know, I, I almost hate saying organic because organic and carbon-based really mean the same thing. But in farming, we talk organic, that's some sort of certification. I'm talking about biologically derived nitrogen sources, um, legumes, manure, compost, etc. cetera. Um, those tend to be released, the nitrates release slowly. So the plant never has this big uptake of nitrate. Um, having balanced fertility is important as well. You want phosphorus, you want sulfur, you want zinc out there because all those are important for converting the nitrate into protein. So um, balanced fertility is important. And, and when you harvest that, 
do not force animals to graze the lower stock. That That is probably 90% of it right there. Do not force them to eat stock. If they're eating stock, they're losing weight anyhow. There, there is no benefit to the animal. There's only detriment by forcing them to eat the stock. I, I did a study down in Texas. We were trying to make um, high nitrate feed just for research purposes. We cut the plants uh, two inches off the ground and the nitrate came back at 5,900. It said, do not feed this, this is toxic. Then we, and this was all scissor cut and we did a foot of row, foot of row, foot of row. Cut it two inches, six inches and 12 inches. And at six inches, cutter height, it dropped down to 2,800. And at 12 inches cutter height, which is really about where you probably would graze a sorghum sedan, leave the bottom foot of the stock. Um, it was 1400, completely safe. And so depending on how much of that stock you consumed, it was either highly toxic or completely safe. The same exact plants, same exact field managed completely the same other than how much of the plant we took. So that's probably really number one. Being generous with phosphorus, sulfur, and zinc, kind of stingy with the nitrogen. You know, you don't want to completely fail to fertilize it, but don't over fertilize it with nitrogen either. Um, but having a diversity of plants out there and tall growing plants, short growing plants, really, really beneficial. Having sun hemp and cow peas and buckwheat and all those sort of things out there will also help reduce nitrate issues.